what I'm taking you through today is really, it's about demystifying what is a personal brand. How do you become that best version of yourself? I can see most of us today are in fact business owners. I do go through a lot of content because I want you to take as much as you can, sit with it. Um, we are going to do Q&A at the end. So I think what we start at, we finish 10.30. So at about 10 past 10, um, we'll stop so that we can do Q&A. Please feel free to put questions on the chat. So to kick off, I want you to think about the brands or the branded products that you use since you woke up this morning. So it could be a toothpaste you used. It could be something you're wearing, a car you got into, um, the general products you use. And generally the most typical ones, and I know we're not in a face-to-face -face workshop and in the interest of time, I'm going to maybe plant some seeds here, but typically the ones that always come up is Colgate or um, Vaseline or, you know, the general products, but always there's a phone brand and it's either Samsung or Apple. So in fact, I am going to stop sharing for a second. So if I said to you, okay, let's consider an Apple iPhone. What words, images, or experiences come into your mind when you think of Apple? What do you automatically associate with the, with the Apple brand? If you can, guys, this is uh, interactive. So share with me on the chat. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about Apple? Otherwise, I'm going to pick on you if no one shares. Okay, thank you. Aesthetic, style, functional. Oh, you guys are a great group. Fruit. The fruit, absolutely. Tech, quality, expensive, camera. So if I said to you, okay, so what is a brand? A brand is a promise because it's a promise you know you're going to get from that, from what it's, from all the things that you've mentioned here. Brands are also, it's about emotional bonds, right? It's about really, but what it comes down to, it's a sorting device. Because if I said to you, I'm going to offer you Coca-Cola or just a no-name brand, you know, red ribbon wrapped around it, which one are you going to go for? Naturally, you're going to go for Coca-Cola. Why? Because it's that promise of, tr of thirst quenching, of joy, of happiness, of whatever the ads are telling us. So now, if I said to you, let's think about people that have become brands who would you think of and again i'm going to fill in the blanks here but i think we'd agree people like steve jobs like mediba like oprah winfrey so now let's take oprah and if i said to you again what words images or experiences do you think of when i say oprah winfrey what's the first thing that comes into your mind can you put that on the chat for me Trust. Yes, exactly. You get one and you get one and you get one. Thank you for that wealth. But I think also, would you agree that she's a humanitarian, that she's an amazing listener, right? So what's going on with my slides now? So we've spoken about this. So Jeff Bezos said it best. And he said a brand for a product is like a reputation for a person. So think about that. Because in the same way, these brands create these words, these images, associations in our minds, so do you. And what I want us to look at today is how do you create the desired words that come into people's minds when they think about you? So in other words, what do you have to do to become a brand? And why does this even matter? Because your brand is your sorting device. As a business owner, as an entrepreneur, people will buy into you before they buy into your product or service. What's gonna differentiate you from your competitors? It's your brand. And your brand is the promise that you make, implicitly or explicitly. So another way to think about it is, what do people expect of you when they engage with you? Because from the minute you engage with your customers, your suppliers, even the ladies in pick and pay and woolies, you have a brand because you're either branded as the smooth professional who gets the job done or that impatient customer who sits on their phone that isn't listening. And your brand is a story and it's a story that helps other people tell themselves a story about you. So that's why everything we do communicates the essence of your brand and it's up to us to consistently and persistently show up in a way that is going to amplify your brand. Because your brand, and sorry guys, by the way, you will get the slide deck, so don't worry to copy down these slides. 
Your brand isn't what you say about yourself. It's what other people say about you. And you've got to position it or it will be positioned by others. Because if I said to you, think about a colleague, think about one of your suppliers, think about a client, it, are there words that come into your mind about this person? Yes, there are. And the same is true of you, that there's this vocabulary that's being created around you, whether you're involved in the process or not. So what is the starting point? Okay, what do I do? How do I create this brand? Number one, it's deciding. What do I want to be known for? So I want you to think about, and if you've got a piece of paper, it's even more powerful if you write it down. But think about four words, and you can have more if you want, that when someone thinks of you, what do you want to come into their mind? Do you want that person to see you as trustworthy, as creative, as innovative, as ambitious? You know, what are those words for you? But then there's a second part to it, because it's not enough just to think about those words. The question becomes, what are you doing every day to demonstrate it? Because we can't walk around with a T-shirt that says ambitious, trustworthy, loyal. Our brand is experiential and we're experienced moment by moment, second by second and interaction by interaction by the people we influence and who influence us. And so we've got to be incredibly deliberate. Is there a disconnect? If I say I want to show up this way, what am I doing to demonstrate it? And that's what the gap we're going to close today. So what is the roadmap that we're going to go through? Your brand, right, is made up of your honor, integrity, your skills and knowledge and consistency. And consistency is going to be said throughout this process today. But if you think about central to your brand, number one is self-awareness. So how well do you know yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, your blind spots? Because the more honest you are, especially about the blind spots, the more you're going to open up to change. And then it's accountability because we cannot blame someone else for our actions. We can't say, well, that client made me so angry and that's why I did that. It really is the sense of ownership and self-leadership about the actions we choose to do. But really central to your brand is attitude because attitude is the lens through which you view the world. And you can choose to have an attitude of self-motivation or self-defeat. And just think about when you've got someone around you that's got that go-giver, that can-do attitude, that will go above and beyond. That's who you wanna rally around. I don't know if you saw the movie, Harry Potter, and whether you did or didn't, in the movie, Harry Potter, there are these creatures called Dementors. And when the Dementor walks away from you, it pulls all the happiness out of you. Do you know someone like that? And sometimes they're in our family. You know, you have that conversation with someone and they walk away and you feel drained because they're heavy or they're negative. And that attitude forms part of their brand. So what else are we going to look at? Our physical presence. Virtually every SMS, every WhatsApp, everything in the virtual space is painting a picture. How we deal with stress and conflict, how we build relationships. And there's a, a secret one, which is your intrapersonal presence, how we show up to ourselves. So it's remembering that we never get to a point, right, where we can say, well, you know, I've, I've got my brand, it's down. I don't have to work on it anymore because we've seen with the people sitting here and even more so with Mr. Smith, which we've seen, which has just happened is that he was untouchable. He was, you know, the, the top of his game and one movement, one wrong decision has completely tainted that name. So it's not to say we cannot make mistakes. We are fallible. We will make mistakes. We are human, but it's what we do with them. How do you own that mistake? And this, I love this campaign. It came out of the UK a few years ago where KFC literally ran out of chicken. They changed suppliers and across 700 stores, they ran out of chicken, but they didn't blame and they didn't shame. They owned it. And they said, this is what's happened. This is what we're doing. And just remember, it's the same as us. Mistakes are going to happen, but think about a customer. You drop the ball, but it's how do you respond to that? How are you showing up? How are you using crisis as an opportunity? And it's how we deal with these kind of situations that really can put you in an even higher standing. So the message that you send out every day is shaped by the way you choose to dress, the way you hold yourself and the way you connect with others. So we may as well send an a message that presents the best version of ourselves. And often when we think of branding, we think dress, but it is such a tiny component, but it is worth mentioning. 
And I mean, clearly you can see the distinction, but the thing about dress is that in physical presence in that way, it's it's got nothing to do with, it's not about budget. It's not about what are you wearing. It's about, are you inspiring trust in your clients? Think about something as simple as going on an airplane, right? How does the pilot show up? They're groomed, they've got that uniform, there's that aura of authority. But if this guy in the bottom left showed up and said, wow, really excited about this trip to Cape Town, you're looking for another airline. So really that's the question, whether you online or in person, is the way that I'm showing up inspiring trust? Because the trick is about be appropriate to the environment and authentic to yourself. So if your client, Eddie, you mentioned that uh, you're dealing with high flyers, you got to show up in a way then that's going to inspire trust in the kind of client that you have. But maybe someone's got a business where you're dealing with, let's say you, it's an ad agency and you show up in a suit and tie, it's not going to gel. So it's also thinking about, am I showing up in a way that's going to resonate with my client? Now, a lot of when we think about communication, right? So number one, the message about today is I'm going to share with you a series of BLOs. And a BLO is a blinding light of the obvious. It's the stuff you know, but sometimes in challenge or overwhelm, we forget the basics. And what's interesting about communication is that there was research done at UCLA and Professor Morabian said, when a message is communicated, only 7% makes up the actual words that come out of our mouth. The other way the message is interpreted, 38% is your tone of voice and 55% is body language. So by tone of voice, it's about, you know, if, if I said to you, I'm really excited about being here today, it's very different to, I'm really excited about being here today. So again, that's tone, and we're gonna go into body language now. So if we think about just the 7%, right, the words that are coming out of our mouth, go back to the basics, things like manners matter, you know, please, Thank you. Even if that person is doing what they pay to do, think about when you go above and beyond. You just want that thank you and that acknowledgement. And are we doing the same to other people? Also mind what you're shutting down. So if you're sitting in a meeting situation or a brainstorm or whatever, the, whatever it might be, and you are that person that's constantly going, but it can't be done. That's not possible. What is the image you're creating? So you want to be that problem solver. But really, that 55% where the real message is communicated. Some things to think about when it comes to your physical presence. Number one is eye contact, because the sooner that you make eye contact with someone, even online, signals to that person, I'm present, I'm listening, and I'm fully engaged with you. And body language is really, it's going in two ways, because it's number one, what am I communicating to that person in front of me? But your body language is going a level deeper and it's what are you communicating to yourself and they did um there's a great ted talk by amy cuddy and she, what she's a social psychologist in new york and they did research and they said they put people in what they call high power poses so you can see the the top row so especially that wonder woman pose and they said after two minutes what they found is that testosterone went up and cortisol the stress hormone went down and so what she says is that before a really daunting pitch, a conversation, something that makes you nervous, okay, not in front of people, but literally you can stand in a power pose to boost your physiology. But it's not just about, you know, I'm going to boost it for two minutes. It's often we stand in a powerless way much more often than we're, than we're aware of. And even think of you sitting in a meeting. Did you show up with a book and a, note, a, a, book and a pen to show that I'm listening, I'm fully engaged? Are you sitting in that meeting? All of these things, how are you walking into that pitch? Even if you are so nervous and there's a lot riding on it, the way that you walk in with your shoulders back and eye contact and the firm handshake is signaling way more than those words that are going to come out of your mouth. And the other three Ps, my, I call them my three Ps of the nonverbal. The one is preparation. So before you go and meet with that person, have you gone onto LinkedIn? Have you seen what they look like? Have you seen why, where did they work previously? Where are they working now? What are the challenges in their business, the industry? So when you sit down to that meeting and you show that you're fully prepared, that puts you in another level in their minds. The second thing is about participation because you could do the research, but if you're sitting in an environment and you don't say a word or you miss that opportunity to share, you get known as a no-name brand. 
And no name brands are amazing for washing powder, but not for you. And that's where you show your value is, you know, this is what I think, this is what I would suggest, this is what I recommend and why, because otherwise you get seen as really sweet and that person who takes really good notes, but you've lost your opportunity. And the last P is being punctual. Because you know we all have that person who's always 20 minutes late. And what happens when they arrive 20 minutes late is you get annoyed, you get irritable, and you start to label them as unreliable. You know, we almost to the point want to lie to them. And you may think, oh, well, it's only five or 10 minutes. But what that person is probably thinking is, if this person cannot show up for a meeting, how do I trust them with my business? So just plan ahead of time, get the link, make sure there's data, make sure you've got good connection. If you're going in person now, leave an hour early to make sure in case there's traffic or whatever it might be, so that you arrive calm, confident and on time. Because clients will buy into you before they buy into your products or service. So just other things to remember is just about that consistency. Am I being, you can't shoot lights out one week, drop the ball the next week. Is there consistency in my delivery? Transparency, if there's a problem, if something's gone wrong, share it, communicate it, own it. And it's also about that long game. You know, we all are waiting for the huge deal, but those are rare and they do come along, but it's really about if you can keep building trust and build the relationships you've got now and be consistent, that's where the business really grows. And also the human touch, you know, we really, it, and because times have been challenging, we do hide behind emails or WhatsApps, but the more that we can pick up the phone, the more that we can start to be seen in person, the deeper those relationships strengthen. And it obviously integrity. So I'm going to, I might skip some things just because where we are in terms of time. So the next thing to think about now is your interpersonal presence. How do you deal with stress and conflict? Because you might tick all the boxes in terms of the verbal and the nonverbal, but the, the image that someone has of you is that you're difficult to work with. And that forms part of your brand. And so that's why self-awareness, really knowing yourself is the key to becoming a powerful brand. So it's also just going through these questions and asking yourself, okay, do I respond defensively to criticism? Do I always need to be right? Am I always in a hurry to get the job done? Am I always blaming? Um, and then maybe, you know, you could say, well, growing up, I was in a family of seven. So if you didn't shout or you didn't like, you know, put up your hand and force your way in, you weren't going to get something. Am I carrying those in now? But we're not going that deep today, but it's really the sense of, okay, do I know myself? Now, if you imagine in your car, it's really smart because it's got this internal warning system. The fuel light goes on, the brake light goes on, you know you need to go and check, you're about to be in danger. And we've got this incredible body wisdom that signals to us you're about to be in danger. And what I'm talking about is that, let's say you get triggered and we all feel it in our bodies first. Think about when you get angry. Do you feel it in your fists? Do you feel it in your stomach? Do you feel like your throat is closing, your jaws clenching? And the sooner that you can start to tap into this body wisdom ahead of time, you can almost catch yourself and go, wow, okay, I'm not in the right state to have this conversation, to approach this person now. So use that body wisdom. And really when it comes, because it's hard, how do I be a great brand, but I've got to have a hard conversation or I'm going to have to encounter conflict. And I think, you know, firstly, it's also just always assume positive intent. If someone let's say is a little bit off to you or not their usual self. We often go, well, it must be me, I've done something wrong. But it's just remembering that everyone lives a story that you know nothing about. Could it be that this person just got bad news? This person has a, a child who's not well and it's changing the way that they respond rather than putting it on yourself. But really the rule of thumb, if you can remember when it comes to conflict, react to the outcome not to the event. So you've thought about who, what do I want to be known for? So let me give you a story that demonstrates what I mean to react to the outcome. A few years ago, I was called in by a charity to brain. They said, can you come in and can we brainstorm some ideas for a fundraiser? And I remember walking through their doors. It was a Monday morning. It was pouring with rain. And as I was walking through the door, I'll call her Jill. The client was walking past me. I said, Jill, don't we have a meeting now? And she said, you know, I just have this migraine and I just want to go to the clicks and go home. 
And I went, oh, okay, and what about Carol? And she said, I don't know, there was this emergency. She left about 10 minutes ago. Guys, I literally took a breath and I said to myself, what do you want to be known for? And I said, I'm really sorry you're not feeling well. I walked her to her car. I said, we'll reschedule when you're ready. You'll come through to us. And she was really appreciative. That's reacting to the outcome because I know they're amazing. I know people get sick, life happens. But don't get me wrong, when she walked through that door and she didn't try to cancel and she didn't postpone the meeting, I was irritated. Like you guys, you plan your days. But I had to override it because I knew what was more important. And if I reacted to the event and I said, but what a waste of my time. I'm coming to help you guys. And you just, you know, you could have phoned me. I will be branded as a very rude person, even though it was on her to let me know. So it's in those moments, if you can just literally imagine pressing that mental pause button so that you can come to a place of reacting rather than so responding thoughtfully rather than reacting. And think the same is true of your, your digital engagements. Think about when you got a rude email or a rude WhatsApp. What do you want to do? You know, I'm going to show them and you respond straight away. But if you said, okay, I'm triggered, I'm going to write this mail, but I'm not going to send it. I'm going to keep it in my drafts. And in a few hours or tomorrow, I'm going to decide how I'm going to respond. That is a power move. It's not weakness to delay because once you send it, you cannot take it back. So it's really asking yourself, is delivering this message consistent with my desired reputation? Something else that we've got to think about when it's, you know, in terms of branding, in terms of who we are, is the way that we give and receive feedback. So just some things, I'm not going to go through all of these, but really just remember when you give feedback to someone, start with something positive. You know, you've done this really well. I'm really happy with this. I would love to chat about this instance or this meeting or the way that this document was done so that you're building someone else up first and don't wait. Because sometimes we think, I'll let it go, I'll let it go, and it builds and it builds and it builds, and all of a sudden, someone does something so insignificant, and you lose it, and then you come across as overreacting. So feedback needs to be given. Do it in a way that's going to build confidence and don't delay. And at the same time, when you are receiving feedback, and it obviously is depending on the way that it's given, but the more that you can receive it from a coach-like perspective, show that you are coachable, show that you can take advice. My husband told me a story, he's in IT, and he has a, a new, they've, they've just hired a whole lot of tier ones, which is their um, kind of their entry-level support desk guys. And the, the one tier one came to him and said, um, you know, I, I love your guidance about how I can really progress in the business. And he said, because I want to do, the, in the, you've got to do these certs and exams. And he said, this is what I want to do. And my husband said to him, no, but this is what I think you should do. If you really want to grow and if you really want to move into that sort of space, these are the exams you need to be doing. And after a long conversation, ultimately what happened is this guy completely ignored him and went to go do the exams that he wanted to do, which is fine. He's got the choice. But what he proved in that moment is that he is not coachable, that he's not willing to take the advice that maybe is not what he would have done in order to progress. So I'll just share that story that it's going to come down the line when we are given advice. What do we do with it? Now, an interesting question to ask is, do you find it hard to say no? And this is a tricky one because where we are now, of course, we business owners, we want to show up, we want to serve our clients. But and we think, well, if I say no, I'm going to damage my brand. They're not going to like me. I'm going to let them down. How could I do that? But there are instances where we do need to learn to say no, because it's about protecting boundaries. And it really is about separate the decision from the relationship. Because sometimes we think, well, if I deny the request, it's the same as denying the person and it's not. So some things to think about, right? Because you may not have, sometimes we think I just don't have time management skills, but it actually comes down to people pleasing. Now, if someone says to you, can you do this for me? Firstly, you want to insert a buffer and you want to say, let me check my schedule and I will come back to you. Rather than your default of going, yes, I'll do it for you tomorrow, knowing your plate is full, knowing you're already under pressure. And the problem with that is that if we just let the we just give away our yeses, you're going to compromise quality for quantity. And it takes one poor delivery 
that can tarnish your brand and reputation. So you don't want to compromise that. Instead of giving away the time or thinking you need to drop everything, what if you said, look, my schedule is completely swamped until Thursday morning. Is Thursday afternoon going to work for you? How's Friday morning? And I promise you nine times out of 10, they'll say, absolutely, that's fine. There are going to be times there's emergencies and you show up to that, but those should be the exceptions. So really think about, so number one, manage that expectation. Is this going to work for you? And let's say it's really challenging or someone really senior, or it's a really hard thing. You could say, currently I'm working on X, Y, and Z. If I take this on, one of these needs to lose my focus. What's the priority for you? So now you've put the ball back into their court. And so it's this really tricky dance, but the more that you can get good at saying no and, and, and really holding tight to your boundaries, because it's also you get what you tolerate. If you get these last minute.com clients where failure to plan on their part makes an emergency on yours, and then the rest of your pipeline gets, you know, has to bear the brunt of it, it's not sustainable. So it's also sometimes we need to communicate to our clients how we need to be treated. So also something you can do is ask for the actual deadline. Because sometimes we get into, we fall into this trap of assuming everything is urgent, everything must be done tomorrow. So when is the absolute latest that you will need this by? And it could only be two weeks time. It might be tomorrow. So give yourself some breathing room by asking that question. Um, and sometimes as well, it could be an alternative solution. You know, maybe you are not the person maybe you can recommend a resource um recently someone came to me and said i know you're a writer can you write my linkedin profile and i am a writer but that is not what i do and i know that me of three years ago would have spent hours trying to write this person's linkedin profile even when i knew it wasn't my forte and the me of today says thanks so much i'm so flattered i am not the best person for this this is who you should speak to because I know what my strengths are and I know where I can add value. So sometimes also, and we don't want to lose the business, but you've also got to understand if I say yes to this, where am I compromising? Am I, am I putting some of my other clients at risk because of that? And guys, even just on a personal note, protect your downtime on your weekends, because this is where you recharge. This is where you recover. And if you say yes to anything out of guilt or fear, it should probably be a no. So, and even Mr. Buffett says no, says that the most successful people say no to almost everything. And really that's, you know, some questions to think about afterwards is, am I comfortable saying no? Do I fill up my calendar with all these activities to the point where I'm burning out and stressed out where actually I should just get a little bit better at owning my no and not giving away my yes. And the other thing to think about when, when it's interpersonal presence is just really knowing yourself what happens to me under stress? How do I react? Am I better off saying, look, I'm really under the gun. I'm going to go work in a coffee shop. I'm going to. And so the more that you know yourself, the better that you will react under stressful situations. So now we move into our intrapersonal presence. So how do we show up to ourselves? And for me, this is the most important part in terms of being a personal brand, because the research shows that we have between 12 and 60,000 thoughts a day. So ladies, I think we are north of 60,000. Guys, I think you play safely in the 12,000 thoughts. But what the research says is that 80% of these thoughts are considered negative. Battling the inner critic, I should be further than I am. You know, it's where the should be reality and where I am. And so we self bash and the inner critic shows up. But now, if you imagine that you are pressing repeat every day on 80% of these negative thoughts, where does that put us? And so you really need to sit and think, because if you know, you think about your phone, right? The operating system, we get this message on our phone that goes, there will be an automatic update at midnight tonight. And you don't have to think about it. The phone does what it needs to do. You wake up tomorrow morning, there's a new operating system. Our operating system is a little bit archaic and ours is on manual. It's not automatic. And sometimes it really is tuning in and saying the thoughts I've got, the beliefs I've got, are these really serving me? Are these really congruent with who I am now and the goals that I want? Because this operating system, if you've got these toxic thoughts, runs the story you tell yourself. 
And what is the story you tell yourself? Because if it's, I'm too old, I'm too young, I should have done it in my twenties, um, you know, COVID, that's the problem with the story like that is it affects what we show up to. Because if you've told yourself and your mind is eavesdropping all the time. So if you've told yourself, I'm an introvert, I'm just bad with public speaking, I'm bad with people and an opportunity comes up, maybe as thought leadership, you're gonna go, no, no, I can't do that. And so that's why knowing these beliefs, choosing the story is so incredibly important and you can change the story. And maybe you've had a hard story up until now, maybe COVID completely rattled your business, but that was a chapter. It doesn't mean it's how the story is going to end. And right now we get to decide how we're going to rewrite for the chapters going forward. But what's also important to remember, it's not only about what we do in our days. What are the activities that we're doing? A large part of what we do is the, the energy, the mindset that we show up to something. And it's largely a matter of where you place your focus. So I was teaching my son this concept the one day he came home from school and he was really upset because there was a kid that was very mean to him. My son's nine and he comes home and he goes, mommy, what's the worst food we have? He says, do we have peas? I said, no, but imagine you're holding a flashlight. And if you're feeling sad and you put your flashlight on the peas, how are you going to feel? He says, I'm not going to feel good. I said, exactly. So now what if we put your flashlight on Xbox, on Lego, on your good buddies? Now I'll feel better. And it's exactly the same with us. So when we move into stress, overwhelm, where do we put that flashlight? We focus on the things we cannot control. And when you focus on the things out of your control, you trigger anxiety. And I don't mean chronic anxiety. I mean, those looping thoughts. How am I going to get it all done? You know, there's too much to do in a day. And anxiety really is what you don't know times what you can't control. And all it is, is it's shining that flashlight. If you are anxious, it's because you are too future focused. You're trying to live in the future or your degree to control your world is way too amplified. So then you want to do an anxiety audit and you want to say to yourself, what do I know? OK, what don't I know? Who can I reach out to? Is there someone who's been through this before? Is there a mentor? Is there a, um, a colleague, someone I know that I can get this advice? The stuff we can influence, great, but it's really the stuff we can't control we need to let go of because that's what affects your headspace in these decision making moments. So let's say you've got to have a hard conversation with someone, right? You can plan and you can say, OK, well, this is my intention. This is what I want the outcome to be. This is what I want to say. But understanding you can't control the reaction. But what we do is we imagine this worst case scenario. This is going to go so badly. They're going to hate me. This is going to go so wrong. And we bring it into the present. and We start living it. So just remember, sometimes all you can control in the moment is your breath, which is enough to respond rather than react. So where possible, let's say you've got to get in the car again, do the commutes again. You can't control that, but you can plan and say, you know what, I'm going to listen to some great audio books. I'm going to do a course. I'm going to do something, listen to podcasts so that the experience is more enjoyable. So some things to focus on what we can control. The one is about, you know, we can schedule in time every day to network. We can work on the business. We can look at processes. We can think about collaboration. Can you build a new skill set? And also, it's, it really is when you can own your thoughts and beliefs and how you show up to challenge. So I'm going to skip this for now. But really, the most important thing is remembering the self-talk because it is the way that you show up. If you show up to a pitch, if you show up to a presentation, if you're showing up to a client and you put them on a pedestal above you and the self-talk is, I shouldn't be here, I'm not their equal, that comes through in every way. It comes through in your tone of voice, it comes through in your demeanor, it comes through in your body language, the energy that you give off. And so the more that you can just practice backing yourself, coming in with good self-talk. It's not just false positive psychology. This is the difference between being a great brand. Because unless you backing yourself, you can't expect someone else to buy into you. So how do we shift that state in the moment? This is really largely a question, a matter of the questions we ask ourselves. And we do fall into, you know, days where we go, well, why does this happen? Why do I self-sabotage? What's the obstacle? 
come up with a better question. So especially even in terms of challenge, okay, what is this here to teach me? What am I grateful for? What can I learn from this? What is the situation here to show me? And the more you can find significance out of challenge, that's your fuel to move through it. And also remembering that the word you attach to your experience becomes the experience. So let's say I said to you, no, I, you tell me something and I say, no, I, I think that's wrong is one thing. But now if you said something to me and I said, but you're a liar, what does the word liar automatically do to your physiology? It gets you triggered, it gets you heated. Imagine someone genuinely calls you a liar because now they're questioning your integrity. Physically, what does that do? It puts you into a complete stress response. So as you go through your day and you'll, you'll reflect on these words later, it really does make a difference. So instead of saying, I'm so anxious, you know, I'm a little concerned. It's not a failure, it's a stumble. Instead of, I hate doing this, I prefer to, I'm trying to make it familiar. So really the word that you attach, because you know people, they go, this is a nightmare. This is the worst thing ever. And so it becomes that whole experience. So choose so carefully the words that you are telling yourself. And also the other thing to remember is that emotion gets magnified. So if you are coming into a meeting with a client, with your team, even your family or at home, if you find that if you are coming in from a place of anger, that is what gets amplified. Emotional contagion is real. So you also really wanna make sure your state is in a, you know, get into a calm space. Choose the emotions that you wanna walk in with this. Set your intention. This is who I want to be in this meeting. And the other thing, guys, to really remember in terms of being a powerful brand, and it needs to be mentioned, and you might think, why does this fit in here? But really is to take your self-care seriously. Because if you think about, you cannot be a powerful brand, a powerful leader, a powerful business owner, if you are burnt out, exhausted, and you know, you're sacrificing sleep for work. And you know all the things you should be doing. So I'm not going to go into detail, but really when you say, okay, I'm going to wake up and walk and you keep that promise, that's where confidence comes in. So the more that you can keep the promises that you are making to yourself, the more confidence, because we're really good at keeping promises to other people. We've got to get better at to ourselves. And again, this is intention. So you get to decide who do I want to be? And then set reminders, set alarms, set triggers. So as you go through your day, you're reminding yourself, okay, bold, confident, patient, calm. And so it just pops up randomly during the day to remind you of who you want to be because that's what branding is. It's deciding. It's not, you know, this is, the, this is the mold that I got. It's really you can shift into the kind of person that you want to be. So now if we change track a little bit and we think about our virtual presence, right, and take something as simple as email. When you get mail, you've got three choices. You can open that mail straight away, you can save it, or you can delete it. What makes you decide? It's the sender, it's the name of the sender. If you get an email from who you consider a really important client, you're not gonna ignore that mail, you're gonna open it straight away. And so when someone gets your mail, you want the same thing. It's a mail from X, this is valuable. So again, I'm not going to go through all of this in too much detail, but think about the basics of email. We get in a hurry, right? Did you spell the name right? Think about when someone spells your name wrong. Grammar, punctuation, did you sign it off? Is it appropriate? Just taking that once over makes the biggest difference because think about how you feel when you get a very badly worded email. So these are just some things you can think about in your own time. They come from Seth Godin to master your mail. And guys, the thing is also, you know, when we think about virtual, consider WhatsApp as well. This is used to be a personal tool. It's a business tool. We communicate to our suppliers, to our clients, to our families. And it's also just remembering, number one, the photo. Is it an appropriate photo? And number two, the way that you're talking to it, think about tone. If you're talking to a client, it must be professional. It must be have good punctuation, not the acronyms or the smileys or the emojis. So really think it is a business tool now. Am I put projecting myself in the appropriate way? And please, all of you, download Grammarly. As a writer, this is my best friend in the world. It 
just takes away the little, you know, we all make mistakes. We all have those, like we rush and we forget a word. Or if you can download Grammarly, it works in your emails. It works in your documents. You will never have a spelling mistake or a grammar mistake again. And the way that you show up is that much better. So please, Grammarly.com. And then just something else also to remember is in terms of meetings, whether it's online or in person, is just it's an incredibly important part of branding now. If you're sitting in person again, it's how are you showing up? What is your posture like? What is your body language like? And if you're online, please keep the camera on, especially if you're talking to a client or a customer, because what you miss is that body language. So let's say we had a discussion and I think the meeting went amazingly well, but the camera was off and I missed your smile. I missed your jaw drop. I missed your eyebrows raise. I missed your arms fold. And the more that we can have eye contact, the more that we can have that in-person connection, even if it makes sense to keep it online, it doesn't mean you have to now drive three hours or drive an hour when online is really convenient, but keep the camera on and make sure that you also, the way that you're sitting, the way that you're showing up is portraying and displaying trust. So some things is that we can't necessarily change meetings, but some things to think about is, you know, it's an, always an opportunity. It's an opportunity and maybe you could think, well, what skill do I want to demonstrate? How do I want to make this meeting most impactful? Um, again, and I think the most important thing is just to make sure there's a structure because people's time is valuable. So the more that we can show up prepared, the more efficient and the more that we will show up in that way. So I'm going to go through skip this part to move to the last one. But what uh, what I want you to remember from virtual is consistency, is that wherever you are showing up, whether it's on social media, whether it's on LinkedIn, and I do advise all of you get a LinkedIn profile, have a good summary, have a good, just a nice photo. It's a nice way of thought leadership. Definitely, I would invest in a good LinkedIn profile. But the person who shows up in a meeting to the person on LinkedIn, whatever socials you on, must be consistent. And the more consistent as a brand you will be, the more trust that you that you create. So from Jim Carrey, the I can tell you from experience, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. So moving into social presence, I think we might actually even finish at about, sorry, 20 past, but we will have time for questions. So when you think about it's not only I want to be known as ambitious and trustworthy and a go getter, it's the relationships, it's who knows about me, who am I serving, it's very much now around what am I doing to build those relationships. So if you think about networking right. Think about the old ways of networking in a pre-COVID world. You'd go to these awkward events, you'd walk around, you'd collect business cards, you'd never use the business cards, they'd go into a drawer. But that's not networking. And networking now is about connection, conversation and collaboration because conversations are the currency of change. Think about in your business, the more, and because all of you, most of you have all mentioned that it's people, you know, it's, it's, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with relationships that whether it's dealing with art, whether it's dealing with, with wellness, whether it's dealing with courses, you've got to have conversations with people. What are their challenges? How can you be a solution to their problems? And the only way to start to dig deep and move into and get into that sacred knowledge is through conversation. So something is just to remember, technology gets you so far, conversation is the rest of the way. And it really is about giving someone your intention, but the intention, what do I want out of this conversation? And sometimes it's just all I'm going to do, I'm going to have the intention to show up and just listen and be fully present. Um, stick to the present, so don't dig up past experiences. And the one thing in terms of conversation is sometimes I always say, be careful of one upping. So, you know, you say to someone, I'm really stressed and they go, you stressed and you don't know what I'm going through. I'm not well. No, no, I, my COVID, you have no idea what I went through. And so it's that person that always has to one up and you just feel like, well, they're not listening. And just to be aware of that and make sure we are never that person. And also something to mention, how do you have a relationship with someone that you feel like I've tried everything? I cannot connect to this person. And we are going to have people like that. And it's not about being insincere, but if you can approach that person from a 
place of asking for advice. So if you said to them, I'm looking for a great business book, what do you recommend? I'd love you, you know, I'm looking to do another course. Do you know anything? What's your guidance? And people want to share their advice. And if you're doing it from a place of genuine curiosity and genuine interest, that's all you're looking to do is find a foundation to build on this relationship. So let's say they recommend go read this book. Then a few weeks later, you can say, you know, I read this book. I love this. What did you think of that? And it's just building a foundation. So what stops us? Because we know we should be having conversations. But the one thing is sometimes we think, well, I don't know this person. But just remember that everyone has a past, a present, and a future. So if I didn't know, I don't know, I mean, I don't know you guys on the call now, but I could start a conversation and I could say, what did you do before your current business? And I could say, what's your biggest challenge now? And for future, what is a big project? What are you looking to achieve? What are you working towards? And there's always a starting point, but the more that you can get that person to talk about themselves, they will think you are the most amazing conversationalist. And it's really the thing is be as interested as you are interesting. Show interest in other people. Have genuine curiosity in other people. And that is the foundation for building relationships. And often we think, well, I don't have time. But network most when you need it least. But the thing that really stops us is fear. And it's just, it's the fear of the unknown outcome. What if it doesn't go well? What if they don't like me? What if I come across in a silly way? But Tim Ferriss said success is measured by the amount of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have and the amount of uncomfortable actions you're willing to take. And it's often the thing we fear the most that we most need to do. So what's coming up for you when I say that? Is it that conversation? Is it sending that email? Is it making that appointment? What is that thing that you're putting off but will probably yield the biggest reward? And I remember, and I give myself these little comfort challenges. It was years ago. Um, Standard Bank had run a program, a masterclass series for their top 100 entrepreneurial clients. And they flew this guy out, his name Brian Farley from the Netherlands. And Brian, literally, it was that story where he took the Netherlands baseball team in 2010 and he took them to world champs. And then he moved out of the sporting world and now is consulting businesses about developing teams. And I was sitting in the Standard Bank Auditorium, their beautiful offices in, in Morningside. And it was 10 minutes before Brian was going on to talk. And I remember looking around this room and going, there's 100 entrepreneurs and me. And no one is going to talk to him. So I decided, well, I'm going to go say hello. And I just went up to him and I said, Brian, hi, my name's Laurie, and I'm also a speaker. And this is what I do. And tell me about, you know, are you enjoying South Africa? And he was the nicest, kindest, most polite person. And he could have said to me, you know what, I'm going on in 10 minutes, please. I don't have time. He could have been that person, but he wasn't. And so just do these comfort challenges see what happens when you reach out and you just have a little bit of courage then i reached out to him on linkedin then i said to him can i write a blog about your your talk and then we've maintained a relationship so just think what do you need to do who can you reach out to and whether they don't get attached to the outcome but it's more proving to yourself the more courageous i can be who knows because you just never know and really, the thing is, it's not about, you know, we often think, well, I'm scared of taking action, but it really is the cost of inaction. And if you think not only in your business, but emotionally, physically, financially, where will I be six months, one year, three years, if I don't change, if I keep doing what I'm always doing? And I'm not only talking about the business world, that's where self-care comes in as well. Am I neglecting it? Where is that going to put me? And just fears your compass, you know, when those big opportunities come up or those situations or those, you know, a, a talk, a pitch or something. And you think, oh, I don't know. That's just that fear is, wow, this is me going beyond my comfort zone. OK, if you think about when you first started this business, you had that same feeling, but you did it anyway. Let fear be your compass. Your body's hardwired to protect you and keep you out of danger. Don't take it as literal danger. It's the effect of spreading your wings. So when we think about, you know, I said, what are the words that we want from the beginning? What do you want people to know about you? What do you, how do you want to show up? And trust is a really important factor. And 
how do you start to build trust? Because it really is credibility and consistent behavior. So doing what you say you will do consistently over time, because there's an economics to trust. Think about high trust relationships. They, they, things happen fast and there's low cost, but you know what happens when there's a low trust relationship. And one of the simplest tools that you can do to build that trust is to listen. And often we think, well, of course I listen. But think about the last time you engaged in a conversation. Were you listening or were you just thinking about what you want to say next so that you sound so smart or how can I fix it? And sometimes people don't want a solution. They just want a sounding board. So we've got three levels of listening. The one is when someone's talking to you and your self-talk is going through the roof. So someone might say to you, they're asking you a question and you're thinking to yourself, but again, we've just gone through this. Like, when are you going to get it? And your self-talk is just rattling. That's not listening. Level two is where there's a sharp focus on the person. You're listening, you're watching their body language, you're hearing the tone of voice. You really have full focus. And level three is almost, it's this environmental listening. It's salespeople are really good at it. It's where you can almost read the energy in the room when you're talking to a client and you've all been through this and you know, okay, I'm losing this person. What am I gonna say? How do I get them back? How do I raise the energy? That's a level three listening. And it's just sometimes being aware and we can go on autopilot. If I can just make sure that I'm never at level one and where possible, move into level two. And level three is not always going to be for every conversation. But as long as you're not playing at level one and you're sitting in a level two, people feel that. Because listening is not just about showing that the other person wants to know they've been heard, but it gives the other person permission to share. So that you can go through. And some other things, guys, in terms of your brand is what are you doing to create visibility? What are you doing to self-promote? You know, is it thought leadership? Could you be writing an opinion piece on LinkedIn? Um, use social media if it makes sense in your business. Don't think, oh, well, now I need to be on Instagram, but it's not really my thing. Be where your clients are. Do what makes sense to you. You don't have to do something. Maybe choose one thing and go big. I'm across all three, but LinkedIn is my one thing because that's where my that's where my clients sit in the world in the space that I do. Those are my people, and I make sure that I write every single week, whether I feel like it or not. I post an article. I use that article. I post nearly every day. So just get better at putting yourself out there. But really, for for you now, what is your next level? How do you become this brand? And it's it's yes, it's the intention. But often, you know, if we think about everything in our world now, that's our comfort zone. The finance, the business, the way we're playing, the level we're playing, health, everything. Where we want to be sits in our courage zone. And the way that we move from the comfort to the courage is really developing this growth mindset. And a fixed mindset, so this is from Carol Dweck's work, and a fixed mindset really is that frame of mind that goes, I'm bad at maths, bad at numbers, I'm always going to be bad at numbers. But the growth mindset is, look, it's not my best, but I know if I put a bit of time, I know if I go and do that course, I know if I put in the effort, I can become a better whatever it is for you. And especially in setbacks, guys, because that's the world of entrepreneurship. That's the world of having your own business. Challenge happens. But it's understanding that life is happening for you, not to you. So how do you develop this growth mindset? Number one, develop your own life curriculum. So, you know, in school, varsity, you wanted to be this, this is what you had to do. But from where we are now, you're in charge of that. Do you want to get better at public speaking? Go do a course. Do you need to get more technical knowledge? What is it that the skills that you need to take you to your next level? And then you're in charge of that. Confidence really is just that belief in your ability to figure things out. Look back. I know that I've always made a plan. I know that the last time I had challenge, this is what I did to handle it. And it's knowing no matter what comes your way, you always make a plan. Again, question that story. Is the story I've got really based in reality? Is it serving me now? And if not, what am I going to do? What is that next story? And it's also remembering challenge is part of the journey. That's where growth happens. Think about your journey in the last few years, especially during COVID, you know, that challenge, you are not the same person you were two years ago. How did that challenge help you? What have you learned because of it? It's 
it's the effect of spreading your wings. And we don't grow when things are easy. We grow in the hard times. And maybe what you went through then is the tools that you are needing to take you into your next level. And it's developing what I call micro bravery, you know, and it means looking back and acknowledging your wins. Look at where your successes have been. We're so quick for the next goal that we go, yeah, yeah, but you know, the next thing only then, but success leaves clues. So look at your wins. What did I do right? What can I replicate going forwards? And the more you can acknowledge what you've done, that's what gives you the confidence to keep moving forwards. So if you think about what battles have you fought and overcome? What past experience, no matter how challenging, today you can say, wow, I'm thankful for that. You know, and what encouragement would you give your past self? So go through these later, journal, reflect on them. And it's also asking guys, don't fear failure. It's feedback and think, what did you learn from your last failure? Maybe you learned, I should have had more empathy. I should have looked after myself. I shouldn't have ignored the warning signs of the headaches or the whatever it might be. Maybe it was, I didn't enroll my team. I should have done this. And all it is, is just put it into your, because some people think you either have 20 years of experience or one year repeated 20 times. And so you want to take those failures and it's not a bad thing, but incorporate that into your growth. Wow. I learned from that. I'm not going to do that again. Cause then the second time becomes a choice, but take all of that past experience and use it to move you into that next level. So what do we do on the days where I know I should be a great brand? I know I should call that client. I know I should go for that walk. I know I should do one more sales call but you just kind of can't get yourself there. So the tool is using the power of your future self. So if I said to you, are you the same person you were five years ago? Definitely not. So then arguably you are not gonna be that same person in five years time. So if you can now think about your current self and your future self as two different people, you're gonna to start to make very different decisions. So let's say, that you in five years time, you've decided this is the business, this is the position, this is where you want to be, but it requires a lot of public speaking. But the youth today has told yourself you're an introvert and you're bad at it. In order for you to set future you up for success, you've got to be authentic to your future self, which means every time an opportunity comes up, you've got to just put your hand up for it and keep doing it and keep doing it until it's so part of you that when it comes to that five-year goal, you're ready for it. So to think about when you're thinking about your brand, when you're thinking about who do I want to be based on this future self? And these are some questions that you can take yourself through. What is their day-to-day -day life like? What are they doing? And it's not just about the business. It's not just about, oh, they've got this salary and they're driving this. It's what is their headspace like? How do they show up to the day? How do they feel at the end of each day? Who are their friends? What skills do they have? And the more that you can start to get a clear picture of a compelling future vision, that is what brings you into deliberate action today. Because when you choose a behavior, you choose the future consequence. It's not just going for that walk or doing that course or one more call. It's if I had over the course of a week, six months or a year, where is that going to put me? What is that consistent action going to do? So something else that you can think about is what would be an ideal day for you? What does it look like? And then compare the ideal day to what are you doing now? So what could be improved? Either what are you not making time for? Maybe it's what are you not saying no to? Maybe it's what am I no longer willing to tolerate that I've been doing? So really, the more specific about also what am I doing every day that's not serving me and what could I do to shift it is again how you move forward because it's really through consistent action. So you can create yourself into the person you want to be by behaving yourself into it. And this is largely around identity change. So if you said, you know, I want to be healthier. So what are healthy people do? Well, it's creating the evidence. Every time I go for the walk, it's the evidence I'm that. Every time I do another talk, I am a speaker. I am, and so it's just about deciding who do I want to be and then consistently show up to that every day. 
So the last three quotes before we move into Q&A, um, this is one of my favorites. It comes from Austin Cleon, and he said, build a good name. Keep your name clean. Don't make compromises. Don't worry about making a bunch of money or being successful. Be concerned with doing good work. And if you can build a good name, eventually that name will be its own currency. And that's what the essence of a brand is. The other one comes from Dr. Daniel Gilbert, who said human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. We never finished. We never, we never get to that point where we finished working on our brand. It's just maybe we reach a hurdle and then we think about the next goal and we think about the next, but we can never think. That's why having that growth mindset is so incredibly important. It's always having that beginner's mindset. And the last one comes from Woody Allen, who said, 80% of life is just showing up. And that's what branding is. It's just about creating that best version of yourself and then just showing up as that best version of yourself every day. Show up to the opportunities, whether you feel like you're ready for them or not. But if you show up, that's 80% of the work. And the last one to finish off with is sometimes you might think, well, I'm not sure where to start. So rather than ask, well, what I want to do today, it's what would my future self want me to do today? So guys, I'm going to stop sharing. As I said, I know I throw a lot at you in a small space of time, but I hope that it has uh, brought a lot of food for thought, a lot of areas to think about. Um, as I said, you will get the slide deck. Um, but uh, should we open up to Q&A, guys? If you want to put it on the chat, if you want to... Put up your hand. I don't know if I've missed any questions, Ariella. Hi, Laura. Hi, it's Celine. Ariella, Hi. had to leave. I'm, I'm standing in for Ariella at the moment. Oh, yeah, I just um, saw her message. Yes. Um, I don't see... I don't see any, any questions in the chat. Anybody have any questions for Laurie? anything in terms of any of the areas we spoke about and even if you know there's a lot obviously that we spoke about today oh yeah level kind you typing okay perfect i think choose one thing I'll wait, while i'm waiting for your question level is i know that there's a lot but if you can just think okay what's one area that really resonated with me today where am i maybe not putting in enough time or i've been holding back a little bit choose the one thing and then start there and Lebo's still typing. Okay, Lebo, you don't want to just come on and, and chat Lebo, to us? Yeah, you don't need to type. Whoever wants to chat, just put your okay. hand up. Okay, hi. Um, can I talk? Is it Yeah, fine? please. Okay, Welcome. thanks. I was just looking at how to structure the question. Um, what I wanted to ask is, um, you spoke a lot about, um, sounded a lot like Gary V actually, about uh, always just be posting, be active, uh, you know, as much as you can, uh, especially on social media and consistency. The thing is, I wanted to ask, uh, especially when you start looking, I think at social media, more on a visual element, like your Instagrams, uh, you spoke initially about uh, dressing, and, you know, how appearance um, instills trust and everything. So my question is, taking all of that into um, context, how do you develop, uh, build, uh, or what would you uh, recommend as a, a correct strategy in developing and building a, a personal brand? Um, to a large audience, but without oversharing, because I've sometimes uh, noticed that sometimes I don't know, maybe I'm it's just my character, that sometimes uh, people end up maybe oversharing too much on social media, but while developing their brand, but this becomes too much. Like you know, they taking pictures in their bathrooms and uh, uh, okay, no, oversharing no. family, and I'm not sure if you get what I'm getting. Like that no, I get exactly what you're saying. Just, just out of that. curiosity, what is your business? I'm in the tech space, uh, doing e-logistics software uh, for the freight industry. Okay. So firstly, thank you for your question. I think one thing just to clarify before I answer it is, I think you must be as present as it makes sense for you and your business. If it doesn't make sense and the people that you are there to serve are not on those channels, then don't waste your time. Um, I think... You, to answer your question about not oversharing, I'll share my experience because I'm one of those people that I, I don't, I'm, I share nothing personal. I'm a very private person, 
But what I what goes into my thought process of what goes into what I'm putting out there is, is this valuable to my audience? What is going to help solve a problem? What is valuable for them? So it's not about, oh, I went to this restaurant and had this. It's not about, it's got nothing. It's like I'm out of it, the personal side of me of it. My, my lens is about contribution. Is this, how is this going to contribute to someone? So what, what makes it powerful for me is I know if something resonated with me, a quote, a thought, an experience, something that I overcame, wow, this was really valuable to me. I think, and I kind of get a sense, well, if, I, if it's shifted me, I'm pretty sure it's going to shift somebody else. So I think it's really about that lens of contribution and what is it, what's going to be valuable for them. So if in your specific industry, um, if you're saying it's, it's logistics, it's IT, could it be, um, and, and maybe your channel is not necessarily going into the public social media space. Maybe what's more beneficial for you is thinking, okay, who are my key clients? Have I come across, maybe you find an article about trends or how COVID has impacted the logistics business and you find the link and you say, wow, you know, hi, John, I came across this article. I thought it would be really interesting for your business. Have a great day. So that might be more impactful for the people that you interact with because you, you don't want to reach everybody. You want to reach the select few. Um, I'll actually, I'll put on the chat some of Seth Godin's books. The, the Practice is a really good book because it's not that you want to reach everyone. You want to reach the people you seek to serve. And maybe that approach, which is just way smaller, is benefit is more beneficial for you. Maybe if you do want to have some sort of a personal branding, a personal profile, maybe LinkedIn is the place because that's where your people are. You know, so maybe it's a thought leadership piece. Maybe it's five top trends in logistics, five things every business should think about when when um, bringing in a supplier. So that's going to get their attention. And so the more you can think like your client, that's what's going to give you the, the content for what's going to be valuable to them. Does that, does that answer your question? No, thanks. Actually, you prompted a very important idea, um, especially when you spoke about um, whenever you're producing content, always have your audience in mind, everything. Um, yeah, I think that's actually the critical point. I think people get lost in that sometimes where they end up just, you know, entertaining the crowd at all costs um, with any type of content just to fill in space. So, um, yeah, I think you actually did answer because there was, um, there's, I'm actually writing an academic paper right now within okay. the logistics space. And that's something I'm looking at publishing, hopefully towards uh, wow. the beginning of the new year. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's the angle. Yeah, no, that's what, that's why I'm, I'm interested because I, it, it wouldn't be, Something obviously that's of interest to a large number of people doesn't grab a large audience, but I think specifically within the space, I could maybe leverage that quite well to yeah, um, start coming if, across if as a opinion. That's massive thought leadership, and that's the, like your industry are not going to be interested in inspirational quotes. Do you know what I mean? They are going to be interested in what is going to make my boat go faster, what is going to be good for my business, what's going to save us money, what's going to be the most effective. And now you've done this whole research paper. And the fact that it's based, it's an academic paper, which is incredible. And there's all your content. So it could either be sharing snippets on LinkedIn. It could be, and use, you know, go across the board, cut and paste. The, you know, it's distribution of wealth. It's such an amazing resource. You've got to use it. So everything's sitting in there. No, thank you. That was uh, very, uh, yeah, that was, I really appreciate that. Super, well done. Thanks, no, everyone. Thanks, thanks for your thanks. question. Bye. Is there, is there anybody else? Uh, yeah. Uh, what was the book um, that you recommended? So from that perspective, I said it was Seth Godin, The Practice. Uh -huh. Is that the best uh, book you, you'd recommend that so, deals so with that, some of the issues that you spoke about? I think what I should do is um, I'm going to send the, the slide deck to Tracy, who's going to distribute it. Let me put a resource list there and even just say, okay, these are the these are what I find brilliant books around developing habits. These are great books and, and actually just categorize them for you. Um, so let me share a resource list so that uh, it's also based on, you know, on categories and what you're looking, what skills to build. But it, it, I think it's a really good book for entrepreneurs, just so in the, in the way of like 
approaching customers, how you think about what you're doing, adding value. So I'll, I'll put a resource list together. Thank you, Laurie. That would be awesome. Thank you very much. Any, anyone else? Um, Mantla? Well, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I, I, I always find it difficult uh, to separate um, personal brand, me as a personal brand and a, my business brand because of uh, uh, it's still, it's not at the tertiary level, it's still at, uh, as I can say, uh, primary level. It's where the clients, uh, it's clients which um, don't look into the social media a lot. Uh, if they do, it's minimum WhatsApp like that. So that, that's my client base for now. So I found it a bit, um, but at least for today's session, seeks to clarify a bit. Uh, maybe uh, if I work on my personal presence uh, uh, to, to make my presence, uh, personal presence be felt uh, by my clients and then they also value the, the brand, you know? Uh, so so I want to stop you there because you, you've struck on something that I want to just clarify for everybody. And I'm so glad you brought it up. And maybe I should have specified it is that, and you said it, there is no difference between your brand and your business brand. You are the same thing. And I think you struck, and, and you said it completely now is that it's not about, okay, they've got to see me in this way. And then, but they've got to see my business in this way. As a business owner, it's one and the same thing. They buy into you. You are the business, you are the brand, you are what they're buying into. And it's not about, you, if, if, you, if no one had a social media presence, it doesn't matter. You don't need that. It's an added value. It's if you want to show thought leadership, the real branding and the real magic happens. And Mandla, you said it, is if you are communicating on WhatsApp and you are efficient and you are in time and you answer the phone and you are solutions focused and you are always reliable that's what a client wants as you said they 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 may never go into social media you can't prove your trustworthiness and your consistency in social media social media is a tool for a different aspect what really counts is how you are showing up every single day and the consistency of how you are showing up every single day and if you just focus on that you will have clients forever because that's what really counts. So it is one and the same. No, much appreciated. It's clear. No, thanks very much. Thank you thank for you. that. And thank you for bringing that distinction. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. We come May I ask a question or is it too late? Um, we've got a few more minutes. Yeah, we've got about another yeah. four minutes. You good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. This was unbelievable. Um, I'd love to learn more from you. In terms sure. of a personal brand, I'm trying to step out of my personal brand so that my clients don't phone me at four o'clock on a, on a public holiday and they rather phone the team or deal with the team and they're not WhatsApping me. Okay. Like, how do you actually extricate your personal brand so that, yes, you are the business, but there is still a team? That, yes. Yeah. So what I've seen, what some people have done is that they've actually put an, uh, an auto responder on there. So like I, I've got a colleague, actually one of the moms um, at my kid's school who's, create, who's got a, a really good catering business. And I think I, watched, uh, I sent her a WhatsApp um, and there was an auto responder that said, thank you so much. Um, these are the, you know, if you need to get hold of us for this, please contact X for support, please email your queries to this. So it literally just comes as an autoresponder. So I think you, I'm not sure how you, you do that, but I think that's one way so that they can see, oh, okay, it's after hours or it's this, this is who I need to speak to. Alternatively, I think you just need to have the conversation with them and say, you know, phone them back or message the next day and say, thanks so much. Um, did, you know, I'm so excited, I've expanded, and actually I'm not running any of the day-to-day -day anymore. I've got this amazing person, X, this is who you can talk to for your queries, for your orders, for whatever. Um, so going forward, if you can just direct it to them, I would really appreciate that. So it's not being rude. 
And it's not mm -hmm. not making yourself available, but you've got to set the boundaries because if you mm -hmm. don't set the boundaries, it's going to become eight o'clock at night. It's going to become a Sunday morning. So it's just saying, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I've expanded and I've actually got, um, you know, Talia's here who's going to take care of all of this for me now. She's absolutely fantastic. If you come into any problems, let me know. She's going to look after you. And just yeah, communicate. Just... Nothing wrong with that. Okay. And, and I think you can set it that if it's after a certain hour that the autoresponder comes on. You've mm -hmm. reached us off out of hours. Please contact X. Please email Y. But you've got to set the boundaries. For sure. Not so easy. <laughs> no, but I think done in that way, you're not saying I'm not available to you. You're saying my role has shifted in the business. I'm no longer doing the day to day, my role is now more strategic and just phone them and say, you know, I saw you messaged me and I didn't want, I didn't want you, you know, I, I, I want you to get served, you know, timelessly, or I want, you know, I want to make sure that you're being sorted out. Won't you going forwards, this is who you need to contact. And they'll go, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Okay, cool. So Thank you. Yeah, definitely. It's not, uh, you're not letting anybody down. Um, and in any, and in fact, it just shows that there's growth um, in the business. Yeah, which is a good thing. It, it also, when I suppose, gives them confidence in the business. I think also you, you need to let go. Mm. Like it's not only about the client um, contacting the right person. I think because it's been your baby, what I'm sensing is that there's almost this fear of what, if I give it to this other person, is it going to be okay? And that's mm -hmm. also a sign of growth is that you've also got to empower this other team to be able to do it. Sure, 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, we've come to the end of our time and I know that Laurie could keep, up, keep on giving us these incredible pearls of wisdom for, <laughs> for the next hour. And Laurie, thank you. I mean, even that video that you chose and that voice bit that you selected was just brilliant. I, I'm, I, I myself am going to go back and listen to it. I think oh, he, I think he summarized. Thank you.